All right, we're uh, calling this briefing back to order. Welcome everyone back from lunch. Uh, the time is now 1.30. Uh, I'm glad to see our third panel is in place. I don't know if you all here were earlier uh, here earlier today, but a system of warning lights. Uh, green means you've got your seven minute start. Yellow, start wrapping up. Red, uh, we ask you to stop. We'll have plenty of time to interact with you when the commissioners ask questions. Uh, so what I'd like to do is introduce the panelists and then we'll get started. Our first panelist this afternoon is the Honorable Lawrence K. Marks with the New York Unified Court System. Our second panelist is Mr. Ezekiel Edwards with the American Civil Liberties Union. Our third panelist is Mr. James Channon with the Law Offices of James Channon. And our fourth panelist is Ms. Dolores jo Jones-Brown with John Jay College. Actually, we have a fifth panelist, uh, Mr. Jonathan Blanks with the Cato Institute. I will ask each panelist to raise your right hand and swear or affirm that the information that you are about to provide us is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge and belief. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, Judge Marks. Sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Um, I'm Lawrence Marks. I'm a Who's trial court Mike judge on? here in Manhattan. Uh, is it on? Yes, there we go. Right, yes. Okay. Um, I'm a trial court judge here in Manhattan. I'm also the deputy chief administrative judge for the state court system, uh, which involves me in um, uh, administrative and policy issues within the uh, state courts here in New York. Um, so I'd like to address my comments today to efforts uh, we've undertaken in the New York state court system to improve public trust and confidence in the justice system. Um, we've taken many steps uh, to do that here in New York uh, under the leadership of our chief judge, Jonathan Lippman, including proposing measure, measures such as uh, reforming our bail system, preventing wrongful convictions, and raising the age of criminal responsibility, to, to name just a few. Uh, but what I'd like to concentrate on here today is legislation we've proposed regarding the grand jury. And I'd like to explain uh, why we've proposed, proposed this legislation, what the legislation would do, and, and why we think it will improve trust and confidence in the criminal justice system. Um, we also think that uh, it could provide a model for other states that use grand juries. And by the way, um, about half the states uh, in the country um, routinely, uh, as we do in New York, routinely use grand juries to charge people with felonies. Um, so first, why has the New York court system proposed this legislation? Uh, as we all know, public trust in the justice system and in the grand jury process in particular has been shaken by the recent cases in New York City, Missouri, and elsewhere. And as the head of the judicial branch of our state's government, it was incumbent on our chief judge, in light of this crisis in confidence, to evaluate the grand jury process and determine whether changes are warranted. And it is pr particularly so because contrary to what many people think, the grand jury is not an arm of the prosecutor's office. Rather, under the law, um, in New York, and I believe this is true in, in most, if not all, of the other states that use grand juries, the grand jury is a part of the court. That's actually the term that's used in the, the criminal procedure law in New York. The grand jury is a part of the court. So, for example, under the law, the courts in panel grand juries, judges have supervisory authority over grand juries, and judges along with prosecutors serve as the legal advisors to the grand jury. So when the public loses confidence in the grand jury process, it is very much a problem for the judicial Don't branch, the and it is very much the responsibility of the so. judicial branch to consider appropriate <laughs> changes and reforms. And that is precisely what, what we've done. We've offered a targeted, measured legislative proposal uh, which we presented to the New York State Legislature, and I have copies uh, that I'll hand up to you today, um, a proposal that we believe can restore public confidence in this process. And the bill has two parts. <coughs> First, it would reaffirm and strengthen the court's supervisory role over grand jury proceedings in cases involving investigation of excessive police force charges, uh, excessive force charges against police officers. And it would do this by requiring the physical presence of a judge in the grand jury proceedings in these cases. So what would the judge do in such a role? Uh, well, the judge would not be conducting the examinations of witnesses, and the judge would not be deciding which crimes to present to the grand jury. That, that's the, the roles of the prosecutor. Uh, 
Rather, the judge would make rulings on the admissibility of evidence, advise the grand jury on legal issues, and provide legal instructions to the grand jury. And why does it make sense to have a judge present in the grand jury in these types of cases? It makes sense because there's an increasingly held perception in these cases that prosecutors, because they rely so heavily on and work so closely with the police on a day-to-day -day basis, are conflicted in these cases and do not objectively and aggressively present them. Now, is that an accurate perception? Maybe, maybe not. But there's no question that it is a perception and an increasingly held one. So we believe that the presence of a, no a neutral judicial officer in the grand jury in these cases will help uh, to a great extent to diminish that perception. And the second part of our legislation addresses the secrecy of the grand jury. Under the law, grand jury proceedings are secret. Although technically judges have authority to order disclosure of the grand jury transcript, that authority, at least here in New York, has been narrowly construed, very sparingly exercised, and the New York statute provides no guidance on this issue whatsoever. And you may know that in the Eric Garner case, there was an application made to the court to disclose the grand jury transcript, and it was denied. Um, now, it's true that grand jury secrecy can promote some important policy interests. It can prevent tampering with the grand jury investigation. It can encourage reluctant witnesses to cooperate, and it can protect those who are not indicted. But secrecy can also have the pernicious effect of impeding the public's understanding of and confidence in what transpired in the grand jury, and it greatly diminishes public discussion and debate about cases and issues that can be of compelling public interest. So we're proposing legislation that we believe will promote public knowledge and understanding without sacrificing the valid interests that the grand jury, that grand jury secrecy promotes. Our bill would create a presumption of disclosure in cases in which the grand jury votes no charges, where the court finds three factors. One, that the public is already aware of the criminal investigation at issue. Two, that the public already knows the identity of the subject of the investigation or the subject of the investigation <coughs> consents to disclosure. And three, that there is significant public interest in disclosure. Where the court finds these three factors, it would order disclosure of the charges submitted, submitted to the grand jury, the legal instructions given to the grand jury, the testimony provided by all public servants and all experts who appeared, <coughs> and the testimony of all other witnesses who appeared but with their names redacted, and any other information that would tend to identify those civilian witnesses also redacted. And there are further protections uh, built uh, into the bill that we've proposed. Um, so those are the two components of our legislation requiring the physical presence of a judge in grand jury proceedings involving excessive police force charges um, and creating a presumption <coughs> of disclosure in the grand jury of the grand jury proceedings with certain limitations where the grand jury declines to indict and the court finds that certain factors exist. Um, overall, we believe this legislation will go a long way toward restoring trust and confidence in the criminal justice system and in the grand jury process in particular here in New York and in other states that use the grand jury. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Edwards. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for um, having me testify here today. Um, I wanted to focus, since we're talking about procedural justice, on uh, procedural justice and the police and their interactions with the community. Uh, Tom Tyler, who many of us know, a uh, Yale Law School professor, has defined procedural justice as treating people with respect and in an unbiased fashion. Uh, he has noted that such fairness does not depend on crime rate, crime rate fluctuations, but on the behavior of the police themselves. He has stressed that authorities need to acknowledge the basic dignity and rights of citizens to account for decisions that affect them and to make their decisions in a neutral and objective way. And he has said that without such acknowledgement of their dignity and rights, people are likely to feel angry and be resistant to the police. Procedural justice is certainly not a cure-all for all of the problems that we face in policing today, but certainly treating all members of our community with respect, acknowledging their dignity and rights, and treating them fairly, regardless of the color of their skin or the neighborhood in which they live, uh, would take us uh, significantly forward in police community relations. But what I would like to talk about today briefly is uh, a broader view of procedural justice, which is not just about how the police treat you when you're stopped, uh, 
but about why you're being stopped, who's being stopped, uh, what for, uh, how can we achieve uh, procedural justice, how can we achieve respect for dignity and equal treatment, and how can we achieve legitimacy when we have a system in which too often the color of your skin or the neighborhood where you live is a deciding factor in whether you are stopped, searched, arrested, uh, jailed, convicted. Too often without adequate justification, and even when lawful, often for minor conduct that goes ignored in other communities. There is uh, a, a, a plethora of data uh, from New York City, stop and frisks, from Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, Minneapolis, where we and others have documented the uh, startling racial disparities in who gets stopped, who gets frisked, and who gets arrested. In New York, between 2004 and 2012, there were 4.4 million stops. 83% were of black and Hispanics, 10% were of whites, 30% were either illegal stops or of questionable legality. Uh, almost nine out of 10 did not result in any further law enforcement actions because the person was innocent. You see the same data in the cities that I mentioned. We looked at Minneapolis police departments and looked at arrests, not just stops, and we found that Blacks were eight times as likely to be arrested as whites for vagrancy, nine times for disorderly conduct, 12 times for marijuana possession. Indeed, we put out a report in 2013 documenting shocking racial disparities in marijuana possession arrests in every uh, corner of this country, regardless of demographics. The simple but unacceptable fact is that your Fourth Amendment right to be free from unreasonable or even sometimes reasonable searches and seizures is different based on the color of your skin and where you live. And the fact is you are more likely to be arrested based on those factors than if you were to live in other neighborhoods for the same conduct. So even if all those stops had been achieved procedural fairness, which of course many of them probably did not, but where the police treated you with respect, explained why they were stopping you, we still would not achieve the procedural justice that we're here to talk about. If you know that in fact, if you had a different skin color or you live somebody else, you wouldn't be getting stopped, you wouldn't be getting searched, your likelihood of being arrested would be down, or the same conduct, the same minor conduct would go ignored. So we can't achieve procedural justice in we, unless we examine who we're stopping, why we're stopping them, and what we're criminalizing. In this country, we have developed now a harmful reliance on the criminal justice system to deal with social and public health problems. Drug use and addiction, mental disabilities, un unemployment, underfunded and overcrowded schools. Indeed, as part of our bloated and wasteful expansion of incarceration over the past few decades, which as we all now know, make us the world's leading incarcerator by leaps and by bounds, which starts with police contact, many police departments have expanded the use of arrests for low-level, nonviolent infractions, loitering, vagrancy, disorderly conduct, marijuana possession, trespass. This arrest-first, arrest-often approach has needlessly ensnared tens of thousands of people into the criminal justice system. Uh, it has led to arrest and conviction records, jail time, and prison sentences that could and often should be avoided. Each of these harmful, potentially traumatic consequences are followed by more negative consequences that can cut off opportunities for advancement and increase the likelihood of future contact. The number of stops and arrests harms both individuals and communities, and along with the racial disparities, create a sense of illegitimacy, resentment, and distrust. As part of re-envisioning and restructuring their relationship with the communities they serve, police departments need to change how they view their power to stop and to arrest. Detaining someone and even more arresting someone should be seen as a scarce resource, an expression, an expression of awesome state power and authority, depriving people of their liberty that should be used as sparingly as possible. It should also be understood as an act that can cause harm, disrupt lives, generate negative consequences, and as it potentially pushes people away from civic participation when abused or overused literally fray our democracy. As University of Cincinnati criminal justice professor Robin Engel said here at John Jay on a uh, conference on pretrial justice last month, when arrests become systematically viewed by police as a limited and precious commodity to be used sparingly and for the most chronic or serious offenders, then change throughout the criminal justice system will likely resort. In other words, we as a country, just as we as a country need to incorporate restraint in our use of incarceration, the police should employ a principle of restraint in stops, searches, and arrests. 
I am inspired, for instance, by the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program in Seattle, a pre-booking diversion pilot program developed with the community to address low-level drug and prostitution crimes. It diverts people away from the criminal justice system. It doesn't eliminate contact with the police, but it does treat arrests as a tool to be used more sparingly. We must adjust the framework within which police have been operating for many years, in which stops and arrests have become cheap commodities. We must see them instead as precious commodities in order to achieve our goals of legitimacy, fairness, dignity, and equal treatment. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Mr. Channon? I have, sp I have spent the last 45 years trying to make police departments in the San Francisco Bay Area accountable to the people who pay their salaries and depend on them to bring law, order, and justice to their community. I have worked on political campaigns for police reform and represented police officers and police employees. I have been involved in 18 wrongful death cases involving sh shootings by police officers and prison guards and litigated a much larger number of excessive force cases. For the past 15 years, I've been involved in litigation with the City of Oakland in a single case, first trying to get compensation for over 120 victims who served over 40 years for possessing drugs that were planted on them by police, and then for the last 12 years trying to make the Oakland police comply with a consent to decree that would bring contemporary law enforcement standards and constitutional policing to Oakland. There are now signs of real progress in this case, and the Oakland police are now within sight of full compliance. There is no one-size-fits-all solution to problem officers and problem police departments. Various options have succeeded or failed due to the quality of police and political leadership, the will to use severe enforcement options where lesser ones have failed, and the amount of outrage and publicity over the problems caused by police misconduct. There are, however, basic principles that must be attained in order to have meaningful reform in any police department. Supervisory accountability is one such principle. We often focus on single officers or groups of officers engaging in acts of misconduct. However, many of these incidents are directly related to poor supervision, lack of leadership, and systemic failure to hold officers and supervisors accountable for their actions. Recent incidents involving individual officers shooting African American men are sometimes attributable to one police officer who made a mistake or worse. However, far more often they are reflective of a culture of lack of accountability that leads directly to these tragic and often avoidable incidents. In 1979, Oakland police killed seven African American men. Many more were killed nearly every year thereafter. In 2014, a single officer involved shooting. What has changed is the creation of a culture of accountability, including supervisory accountability. In Oakland, we insisted that every police officer be supervised 85% of the time by a primary or assigned supervisor, and that the assignment <coughs> detail permit the maximum of one primary sergeant for every officer under normal circumstances. This means every police officer had a supervisor that is clearly responsible for them, and that supervisor thus becomes much more responsible for making sure the officer does his or her job in a constitutional and professional manner. Body cameras have also played a major part in the culture change that is starting to take place in the Oakland Police Department. They were first introduced several years ago and are now required for all police department personnel. They must be turned on for all enforcement stops and other stops by Oakland Police. Perhaps more importantly, officers are disciplined if the cameras are not used as required by department policy. I believe the widespread use of cameras is a major reason for the decline in the number of complaints against Oakland Police in 2014. One use of cameras that has not been widely discussed is their use for training police officers as to how to interact better with the community they are sworn to protect. Supervisors in Oakland are now able to look at videos of enforcement stops made by those they supervise. They can see things that will help them advise those officers to better interact with the people they encounter. 
Often the first few seconds of an encounter sets the tone between the police officer and the citizen they are stopping, questioning, or assisting. Citizens respond better if they are treated with respect. The cameras can provide a useful tool for helping younger officers do a better job and supervisors get a more accurate picture of how their subordinates are performing in the field. Stanford University Professor Jennifer Eberhardt has been retained to help Oakland Police comply with the consent decree requirement that pertains to racial profiling. That task was written to ensure that people of all races were treated equally. Despite improvement in many areas, Oakland Police still search a far higher percentage of African and American African American and Hispanics that they stop with no corresponding increase in yield, that is contraband or some other reason to justify the stop. Dr. Eberhardt will look at film recordings of enforcement stops and consensual encounters Oakland police have with African American and Hispanic citizens. Her work will focus on helping officers improve their relationship with these communities. Police reform is not easy. There are strong pressures for police to solve crimes, particularly ones that shock our conscience. Police officers almost by definition tend to interact with people in crisis and seldom see the best in our communities. This can have potentially devastating consequences on the officers' own personal lives and in their interaction with the community. We must remember that many police men and women are young and impressionable. They can easily be led to believe the sometimes harsh rhetoric in our media and from our politicians is a call for them to indulge in unconstitutional behavior. This puts an added burden on police supervisors who must never forget they are part of an organization that has the power of life and death. We must demand accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Channon. Ms. Jones-Brown. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Dolores Jones Brown from the Department of Law, Police Science, and Criminal Justice Administration here at John Jay College. And I'm also a former prosecutor in Monmouth County, New Jersey. Um, my comments today are intended to actually humanize and individualize the victims of police behavior that is questionable or clearly illegal and the double victimization of those folks by judicial processes that do not hold those police officers accountable. I want to step back for a moment to a conversation from an earlier panel where Ms. Heather McDonald talks about black on black crime and the uh, National Bar Association's president was talking about her failure to look at white on white crime. In 2011, there were roughly 4,000 white arrestees for the offense of homicide and roughly 4,000 black arrestees for the offense of homicide. The idea that Ms. McDonald would concentrate only on black arrestees for such offenses is an indication that white supremacy lives and white privilege is not recognized. To attempt to tell a group to which you do not belong what they should be concerned about is inappropriate and offensive. My comments today hopefully will help to, again, individualize and humanize the individuals who have suffered at the hands of those who are charged to protect and serve them. So what is most disturbing for me at this juncture where we are today is that we've been here before and we've been here repeatedly. My interest in this topic began in 1997 when I learned that four different cases that were decided within one month of each other. Three of them decided in one week, which all involved black civilians dying at the hands of the police, none of which resulted in criminal responsibility for the police officers. So during a single week in November 1996, the criminal justice system in three different states failed to hold police officers criminally liable for killing three different people under circumstances that had the victims lived been tried and convicted, they would not have been subject to the death penalty or even lengthy prison sentences. Two of the victims were shot, one was suffocated. Their names were Johnny Gamage, Carolyn Adams, and Tyron Lewis. The deaths occurred in Brentwood, Pennsylvania, New Brunswick, New Jersey, and St. Petersburg, Florida.
They ranged in age from 18 to 39. Their underlying offenses were alleged traffic violations, a simple assault, and car theft. Each one was African American, and the officers who killed them were white. Each case resulted in local protests and did not result in the officers being punished via the courts. In the Pennsylvania case, the unarmed motorist Johnny Gamage died while being held down by multiple officers, including John Votis, who was acquitted by a jury. Carolyn Adams was shot by New Brunswick police officer James Consalvo for allegedly biting his finger. A grand jury determined that the shooting was justified. A St. Petersburg, Florida grand jury similarly refused to indict police officer James Knight for shooting 18-year-old Tyron Lewis when he was seated in an alleged stolen car only one month prior. New York officer Francis Lavodi had been acquitted by a state court judge in the choking death of Anthony Baez, a Latino, even after he found that Baez's death was unnecessary and avoidable. The case that would have prevented these uh, offenses from occurring was a case of Tennessee versus Garner. So I take exception to the National Bar Association's president's notion that it's Tennessee versus Garner that leaves us where we are today. I would allege that the case is Graham versus O'Connor, which shifted the focus of the priority for safety from that of individual citizens to that of the police. In fact, the impact of the Garner decision when it was made in 1985 was immediate and substantial. In Memphis, where the Garner killing occurred, the number of blacks and whites killed by police while unarmed and not assaultive dropped to zero. That number had been one white and 13 blacks during the period of 1969 to 1974. Even in New York City, the number of suspects killed by the police <clears throat> dropped from 26 in 1984 to 11 in 1985, but rose to 30 in 1989 when the Graham v. Connor decision was announced. The Graham v. Connor decision allows the police deference in making decisions about when to use deadly force, and that is the focus of that case. After that case was decided, the cases that I was investigating went from 4 to 11 to 24 in 2001, and as we see the continued footage over and over recently, the idea that the police decision making is given deference in such cases continues. In the little bit of time I have remaining, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Graham versus Connor case, I'd like to read this segment from the case. The case involved a person who was a diabetic attempting to stop himself from going into insulin shock. Police officers who followed him simply because he went into a convenience store and came back out without purchasing anything said this. I've seen a lot of people with sugar diabetes that never acted like this. Ain't nothing wrong with the MF, but drunk. Locked the SB up. Several officers then lifted Mr. Graham from behind, carried him over to his friend's Mr. Barry's car, and placed him face down on the hood. Regaining consciousness, Graham asked the officers to check in his wallet for a diabetic decal that he carried. In response, one of the officers told him to shut up and shoved his face down against the hood of the car. Four officers grabbed Graham and threw him headfirst into the police car. Mr. Graham suffered a broken foot and several other injuries, and his case was never resolved in his favor. In the Q&A, I'd like to talk more about the kinds of implications of allowing that kind of behavior by police officers in 1989 and how it affects where we are today. Thank you. Mr. Blanks. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, police interact with the public in many different ways, and fatal incidents are at one extreme of the uh, spectrum of interactions. How police officers conduct their daily interactions with the public and handle misconduct when their officers cross the line in those, an in those interactions is vital to establishing trust within the community. The best way to build this trust is to make officer discipline public, transparent, and effective. The focus of my testimony 
is on the legal regimes that hinder transparency regarding police misconduct and how to address them. Incidents of misconduct will happen, but how, how any given department handles that misconduct is of utmost importance. As Maurice Punch wrote in his book, Police Corruption, Exploring the Police Deviance and Crime, he said, quote, police agencies are not held to be irredeemable when found to have committed offenses, but are assumed to be capable of reform and having public confidence in them restored. In this process, the crucial test for policing in a democratic system is accountability. For without genuine accountability, there can be no legitimacy. And without legitimacy, the police cannot function effectively in a democratic society. But as we've seen in the Black Lives Matter uh, activism, and we heard a lot today, there's a perception of a lack of accountability all over America. Establishing accountability at all levels of police interaction with the public is imperative to restoring police legitimacy and increasing public safety. We should stop and think for a minute about the data that we do not have. FBI Director Comey recently made a speech about the hard truths America must face about policing. Specifically, he mentioned that the data on officer-involved shootings is unreliable because reporting is voluntary and consequently inadequate for an accurate national measurement. Data on other uses of force and misconduct are even more difficult to glean due to various policy and legal hurdles to information. The National Police Misconduct Reporting Project is an effort by the Cato Institute to gather reports of credible allegations of police misconduct so policymakers and others can make informed assessments of the nature and circumstances of police misconduct. At policemisconduct.net, we rely primarily on local media outlets to do the legwork of combing through police blotters for arrests, tracking local police press releases, and covering court proceedings through their final resolutions. Our data, too, is incomplete, but we do not often lack for troubling stories to put on our website nearly every weekday. Unfortunately, all but a handful of states have considerable restrictions on access to police disciplinary files. In some states, even prosecutors who naturally rely on police uh, on rely on police testimony to make their cases, either cannot review those files or must overcome substantial evidentiary hurdles to do so. At least one author has questioned whether these restrictions violate the affirmative prosec prosecutorial duty to provide defendants with impeachment evidence as demanded by Brady versus Maryland. The ideal way to get more data is to expand the access to police disciplinary files. This expansion, however, will be difficult as many of the legal barriers to disciplinary information are state laws that prevent disclosure without a court order. Even then, sometimes the information can only be viewed in camera and in discrete cases. Thus, the changes will primarily need to come legislatively on a state-by-state -state basis. But that brings us to the data that we do have. Even in states like New York that withhold personnel records from public view, alternative data can reveal problems waiting to happen. For example, here in New York City, there is a group, presumably a rather small minority, of officers that exhibit behaviors that could be detected and addressed by early intervention strategies. Uh, according to an investigation of New York City's Civilian Complaint Review Board records, about 40% of the 35,000 New York police officers have never received a civilian complaint, but roughly 1,000 officers have more than 10 complaints on file. One officer has over 50 complaints, but somehow still retains his position. Institutionally, the New York Police Department knows that these 1,000 officers are repeat offenders several times over. Multiple co complaints against a single officer over a period of months or years implies that the officer must at times operate too close to the line of impropriety. Those 1,000 officers represent fewer than 3% of New York police officers, but can damage the reputation of the rest of the department. Cl clearly, some portion of this one, these 1,000 officers are abusing their authority, and the NYPD is either unwilling or unable to remove them from, from duty. And because the public can't know their names and records, we cannot measure how effectively the NYPD has addressed these incidents with any given officer. Outside of the Personnel Records and Complaints Office, there's another metric to determine which officers are more likely to, to be abusing people with whom they come into contact. Criminologist Jerome Skolnick noted that police officers, police supervisors sometimes look at resisting arrest statistics to determine which officers are often crossing the line. The thinking goes, if an officer wants to mete out punishment for disrespect, a resisting arrest charge can justify a night in jail. It can be used to explain why a suspect came in with a few bumps and bruises, or worse. Just as the civilian complaint numbers revealed a small minority responsible for a disproportionate amount of complaints, it appears that a small percentage of the force generates the most resisting arrest charges in the NYPD. The WNYC study uh, I, I mentioned earlier uh, found that roughly 5% of NYPD officers account for 40% of arresting, arrest, excuse me, resisting arrest charges since 2009, and 15% of officers account for nearly 75% of them. In a legal regime in which their personnel records were public, the names in each of these groups could be cross-referenced. Public pressure could force the departments to take appropriate action against specific officers to correct the behavior if possible or move for termination. 
However, the officer's dip disciplinary records remain off limits and their questionable behavior continues to be tolerated in precincts around the city. Please, uh, excuse me. The alternatives to legislative reform are, are as the following. Passing meaningful legislation in 50 states is going to take years of grassroots efforts and campaigning. In the meantime, citizens, journalists, government, and lawyers can compile data that is publicly available to use to shine light on misconduct in their jurisdictions. Here in New York, the Legal Aid Society is compiling a database of misconduct allegations against NYPD officers to, to act as a clearinghouse for defense lawyers. A database like this warehouse is publicly available information from court proceedings, so it can be used in future cases as Brady material. Uh, after a six-month Sun investigation showed how much money police brutality lawsuits had been costing the city, Baltimore, Maryland, started its own publicly searchable database of civil suits and is publishing the results of those cases. Uh, the city should go further by removing the non-disclosure clause that typically attaches to settlements that prevent plaintiffs from discussing the facts of the case rather than ac af after accepting the settlement. Americans cannot effectively address police abuse of deadly force without first addressing police violence, and we cannot hold police accountable if we cannot even measure how often they are acting inappropriately. Policies and laws that shield officers from consequences of inappropriate violent behavior or abuse of authority produce a culture of tolerance, if not encouragement, of that behavior. Data indicates that only a small minority of officers repeatedly abuse their authority, but the laws that, the, but the laws that protect those officers' anonymity make them indistinguishable from the majority of law-abiding officers. This minority's tolerated presence in the ranks tarnishes the reputation, legitimacy, and authority of their fellow officers and their departments. For these reasons, making police discipline more transparent and more effective across the board is in law enforcement's interest and the public interest alike. Thank you, Mr. Blanks. We'll start the questioning with Commissioner Yaki. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to address this to uh, uh, Judge Mark um, about your proposal. Um, somewhat interesting, but I'm to me the devil might be in the details. You, you're talking about the procedure of using a judge as a sort of neutral third party presence there. I, I presume that part of the intent is to try and chill any overzealous activity by a prosecutor? Or, or maybe the contrary, uh, when um, prosecutors don't present cases as aggressively as maybe they would if um, they didn't have this, what's perceived as a conflict of interest uh, in I, a case involving no, I see what a police you mean. officer. I, I, guess, I guess my, my mindset is viewed, has been skewed by reading the Ferguson transcript of the grand jury where the prosecutor there seemed to be rather zealously promoting one view rather than the other. Would you, would your judge be able to would your judge be able to step in and and ask the prosecutor why are you cross examining essentially cross examining some witnesses and not cross examining others? I mean, one of the criticisms again in Ferguson was that the officer Darren Wilson was allowed pretty unfettered testimony, but in the in the circumstances of a number of eyewitnesses, it appeared that the prosecutors were indeed trying to undermine, undercut, or otherwise. Uh, diminish the value of their testimony. Well, the, the, look, the, 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 the role of conducting the examinations would remain with the prosecutor, but if there were obvious questions, and I don't know that this has happened, and um, I mean, I, I can't say I read the transcript of the, the Ferguson case. I read a lot of news reports about it. Um, but if there were obvious questions that the prosecutor was not asking of witnesses, Sure, the judge could ask the obvious questions, um, and just as as is true with a with a trial, um, if judges don't conduct the examinations of the witnesses. But if there's a question that judge thinks is an important question and is thinks that the the jury um, uh, might be helpful to the jury to, to hear the answer to that question, well, judges ask questions. So like your 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 proposed statute would allow that kind of intervention. Yes. Okay. Um, again, going to the details of your of your of your proposal. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Would the would the judge be able to say? Um, would it, I don't know if it'd be in camera, whether it'd be a sidebar, whether it would be in front of the jury. Um, if the if the if he or she felt that the prosecutor was, as you were to go to your first point, vastly underplaying. Uh, some parts of the testimony, or if you knew, in fact, from media coverage that there seemed to be a glaring omission in in some parts of evidence or testimony that that 
seem to be out there in the media, but were not being presented to the grand jury, would that be something that the judge would be able to bring forward or ask why, why this wasn't done? And I guess, in the end, would the judge be able to essentially testify at a future, future, future hearing, whether it's the U.S. attorney, whether it's the FBI, saying that I don't think that this prosecutor did a good job in making the case? I don't see the judge becoming a witness as a result of this. Um, there, but wouldn't I, that be a, a natural and, and result in, in the case of I, I, what some might call a gross miscarriage of justice? I think the, the transcript would be available if there was subsequent review um, you know, by uh, the Justice Department, for example. But uh, I don't know. It's an interesting question, but I don't, I'd be wary of um, setting judges up to, you know, so that they become witnesses about well, what happened. And I guess that, that's why I'm a little worried about this proposal. I understand the nature of it, but I would, I would see that at some point, if there was serious and substantial questions govern, regarding the, the role that the grand jury and the prosecutor played, and your judge was there making rulings or qu making questions or not asking questions, then the judge, the judge, him or herself, becomes part of the the next level of review. Of course, but whatever happened would be recorded in the transcript, which would be available to uh, uh, the Justice Department or an independent monitor or anyone who was scrutinizing True. what happened in, yeah. within. Well, everything but state of mind. Right. Okay. Thank right. you. Commissioner Cladney? Judge Mark. Your Mark. Judge Mark, thank you very much for, for coming in your testimony. Uh, I found the proposal very interesting. I actually thought that. Uh, uh, a, a proposal would be you just conduct the grand jury proceedings in public, but then when I read your statement, you talked about um, uh, trying to keep witnesses' names out of it or, uh, like you said before, redacting them out of the transcript. Uh, do you think, and of course, I think grand jury transcripts become public if there's an indictment, correct? If there's an indictment, um, right. yeah. Okay. And so, uh, they, well, actually, New York has another issue in New York. We have very narrow criminal discovery rules, and um, they do. In some cases, the grand jury testimony is never uh, disclosed to the uh, defense if there's a plea. But if the case goes to trial. Certainly, the the testimony of witnesses who testify at the trial, their grand jury testimony will be disclosed to the defense and will become public. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blanks. Uh, you talked about, and we're starting to get into this now, the data collection uh, portion of, of this information. And you spoke mostly about, I think, and I, when I read your, your statement, uh, uh, shooting cases, uh, death cases. Uh, do you believe that we should be collecting all sorts of other kind of data regarding police stops and, and uh, minor infractions as well? Well, absolutely. I mean, at policemisconduct.net, the website that we run at Cato, uh, we, we track pretty much any kind of police misconduct, whether it's a DUI on du off duty or if it's, you know, uh, domestic violence, any, anything like that. Because it also, collecting this data not only just shows what the individual officer is doing, but it shows how that officer is treated within the judicial system that he's in. So sometimes you'll see. Uh, cases that seem like really serious offenses, but because of whatever reason, the the charges that were very serious get knocked down to something that doesn't even get them fired. And so I think being able to track every sort of uh, misconduct that police uh, that police commit is, is very important. Have you ever seen uh, uh, towns where uh, officers don't get charged with DUI unless they're in an accident? Yeah, Mr. Shannon, uh, I have. Tons of questions for you, but the chairman's not going to let me ask them all. I'll let you ask one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, of all of them here, the, the one I'm most interested in is the distinction between the executive force and the force review boards. We spoke this morning about um, independent review boards for police misconduct, and we never got into how they're appointed, how independent they can be, how do you make sure they're independent, because it seems in my mind that the city council would appoint these boards and the police uh, unions as well as the police associations have big influence with city councils uh, because of elections and things like that. 
Uh, am I wrong or am I not looking at it correctly? Well, executive force review boards are actually police review, police, right. uh, uh, um, police only organization. They're not organizations. They are review of serious incidents by the police themselves. Not we're we're not civilian review boards, which is like the one I was on. Um, so this is a this this and uh, oh, like a debrief situation. The debrief and also identifying training matters and other important things. And we've been looking at these executive and force review boards very carefully in our consent decree, because when when they're properly done, they they uh, uh, look at training matters. They look at uh, all sorts of matters that officers can actually learn from, and not repeat. And uh, we have strict requirements that they be very uh, carefully prepared. But uh, the, the union has no choice but to engage in those. Civilian review boards, I've never seen a union support one yet of any kind. Are they, uh, these uh, debriefs, are they open, uh, are they ever made public or are they confidential, privileged, uh, the result? California, as far as I know, is the most restrictive a state in the nation about disclosing any police activity. Uh, for example, in the shooting of Tamir Rice uh, in Cleveland, you saw the town of Independence, Ohio came up and they said, well, we fired this guy because he freaked out on the range. In California, they would be arrested for that. Um, the, even though we are considered a liberal state, uh, the uh, Assembly and Senate are more or less bought and paid for by the police union, so you would never see um, a, uh, a, a force review board made public. When I was in Detroit, they had that kind of thing, um, where they'd have uh, command accountability sessions where they would discuss complaints and incidents in public, and then they'd have private sessions as well, but not in California. And one last question, Mr. Chair. All right, go ahead. One last question. Your independent review board that you sat on, how did it work and how effective was it and why was it effective, if it was effective or ineffective? Well, at the time I was there, I believe we were effective because uh, we had wide-scale public support. It was a ballot initiative that actually passed by the voters when I lived in Berkeley many years ago. And uh, we were successful, for example, in abolishing the SWAT team because they didn't believe in hostage negotiation in those days at all. Uh, the FBI didn't train it at all. And we flew out a police officer from New York, actually, who was a psychiatrist who trained our officers in hostage negotiation. That was a long time ago. So we had our successes um, and, and we had our failures, our, our discipline. Uh, process I don't think worked very well. It didn't succeed to the degree that I would have liked to have seen, but it was it was good. At least people got to see. But since Copley Press, which is a California Supreme Court case, uh, no civilian review board in California can meet publicly on discipline at all. Thank you. That's Mr. Actenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Channon. Uh, anyone who can tame the Oakland Police Department has my uh, undying respect. I'm wondering, it, was it the supervisory accountability um, construct that was, you know, sort of turned this around? Or could you delineate the elements that you think were um, uh, dispositive and also you said that for the longest time your consent decree went un, um, unenforced essentially but as of late uh, you're, you're getting pretty close. To, what, what changed? What changed was um, we made a motion um, before Judge Henderson in federal court to put the whole department in receivership because uh -huh. the monitor um, who, that we had two teams of monitors, they were very good, but all they could say was, you're doing badly, and then they would say, well, we'll never do it again, and then three months later, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, f finally, we created a position where they would have the power to hire and fire the police and not only criticize, but make changes. So we got a new police chief, Sean Went. Yes. Um, we, the body cameras, 
and the uh, and the focus on supervisory accountability, I think, are the main things. How significant is executive leadership? It, is the role of the mayor in that situation particularly significant or not? Well, the mayor appoints the police chief, so in that sense it is. But the, the, to have a good police chief is, is very important. I, I, the chief of Berkeley once said to me, he said, isn't all this stuff you do, wouldn't it be better if you had a good police chief? And I said, yes, but what if you don't? So, I mean, I think it's critical to have really good command staff. Given that you've been involved in so many of these cases, are there basic principles that you extract from your experience that um, if they were to be more widely publicized might be helpful to others who have a genuine desire to reform uh, their agencies? I think for too long I looked at individual officers and didn't look at who was supervising them. Uh -huh. So for example, when two out of three of every warrant in Oakland was based on false information or perjury, that was an internal affairs conclusion. I never looked, at, they only looked at the officers who did it, but they never, I never knew who uh, was in charge of training police officers for writing warrants. And that's what I think has changed for myself uh -huh. the most. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a couple questions. Mr. Edwards, um, what you talked about in terms of uh, procedural justice, questions about why you're being stopped, who is being stopped as a precursor to the discussion that we were having here today, what happens when you are stopped, really resonates with me personally and as a Chicagoan. Um, many years ago when I was a young lawyer, I, uh, from a very economically depressed community on the southeast side of Chicago, I was coming home for the weekend to visit my parents. And on the way back uh, north, I got pulled over by an unmarked police car. And as a young man of color, I was always taught, do not get out of your car. If you ever stop by the police, you know, keep your hands on your wheel. Uh, do not step out of the vehicle. So that's what I did. Uh, the officers immediately came to my door with their hands on their uh, holsters, demanding that I get out of the car, which I did. Uh, one officer took me to the back of my car while the other officer proceeded to go into my uh, passenger compartment and begin to search my glove compartment and other areas. As I was presenting, finding my license and looking at what was going on, they popped the trunk. And uh, when I asked the officer, what are you doing? He said, don't worry about it, we're searching your vehicle. I said, well, you know what? This is an illegal search of my vehicle. How do you know that? I said, well, I'm a lawyer. Uh, the officer that was with me called his, to his other officer who was already inside my glove compartment and said, uh, let's go, this guy's a lawyer. <laughs> now, at that point in time, it's still running through my mind, even though I'm a lawyer, even though I know that this is happening in violation of my rights, the first thing I think about is they could plant something. The next thing I think about, they could say I reached for something. So I was very cautious and nervous. So I didn't even want to ask them for their badge numbers or their names. As soon as they began to withdraw, get into their unmarked vehicle, I decided I would follow their vehicle and got their plate number. Uh, I had a friend in the media. We were able to track down who the officers were. And I submitted a complaint to the Office of Police Review in Chicago. Months later, I got a letter saying, uh, we, you know, one paragraph, you, we looked at this. There's no basis. So I know that this happens many times in America, and luckily, for me, I was a lawyer and able to uh, advance my rights, and luckily nothing happened as a consequence. But I know all too well that that's not the case for many people of color in the United States. And recently, the ACLU did a report on stop and frisks in Chicago. And the point that you made today about uh, people being picked up and, and, and ultimately no action is taken. We had, I think it was 250,000 uh, cases of that in Chicago where resulting in no action. Uh, could you speak a little bit more, uh, because that's even, yeah, 250,000 cases where no action was taken as part of the stop and frisk, which I think was even worse than what was going on here in New York. Could you speak a little bit to that issue? Uh, 
if you have some sure I mean it's well first of all it goes a little bit I don't know uh, mr. Cladney you asked about um, data collection uh, and uh, should the police be co collecting other data and certainly the ACLU advocates for comprehensive uniform data collection of stops frisks searches hit rates meaning contraband which was brought up earlier um, uh, for police departments around the country it's somewhat stunning that if you ask police departments, even mid-major police departments around the United States, can you tell us how many people you stopped last year by race? Can you tell us how many people you searched and what your hit rates were? Many of them can't do that. Uh, and one of the reasons we want to know that is so that we can document as we've done in Philadelphia, in New York, in Chicago, in Minneapolis, um, these kind of vast disparities. And what you often find is so many times people are stopped and no further action is taken. Uh, many times the hit rates are higher for whites uh, than for African Americans. Um, so, someone asked me why that is. I don't know empirically. But I have a suspicion, and, 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 and maybe I'm wrong, that when police generally stop white people, I'm just, that they are using uh, better police training, reasonable suspicion, looking for actual um, kind of real furtive conduct, and, and they're more likely to be right than if they are saturating communities and stopping folks like you because you're driving at a certain time in a certain neighborhood and look a certain way. Uh, that's not generally how uh, they, they, they deal with uh, other communities. And so um, I think data collection is, is a big part. And we've even worked with police departments that weren't aware of how bad that their disparities were. When we show them the data, uh, it, it puts uh, them on alert, but also motivates them, uh, particularly progressive police chiefs, to go for reform. But it's also why I talked about looking at arrests and stops really more as precious commodities, not mm -hmm. something to be treated as we're going to stop everyone in this community, but something that uh, needs to be um, much more protected. And if you want to have better police community relations, in addition to treating people fairly when you stop them, you really have to think about, is this a good use of police resources. I also think quickly that um, how police evaluate their productivity and their success needs to change. It can't just be, uh, certainly crime rate is important. Uh, m number of arrests I think is overvalued. It has to be about how are we relating to the community? Are, are we arrest arresting fewer people, diverting more people? Uh, could be actually signs of progress and productivity in, in a different way. So we have to kind of reevaluate those metrics. No, I definitely agree that we need uh, more and better data collection. But I think there's a further step, and I'd like you to comment on this. The next step is what do we do with that data? So, for example, back in Illinois, uh, we have a, a state rule that says any uh, police officer who does a stop has to report the race and ethnicity of the person that they stop. A couple years ago, the Chicago Tribune did an investigative story on McHenry County indicating that, uh, which is a county that's increased in, in Latino population, that many of the stops were of, of whites. And when you looked at the data, the actual cards they were filling out, you saw a name, check mark white, and it was Arturo Hernandez. And another white was you know, Mario Moreno. And it turned out that they were mis, uh, mismarking uh, the, the ethnicity or the race of that person in order to make it seem like there wasn't uh, a disparate impact. So in, the, in Illinois, there's no accountability. We collect the data, but it sits there. And unless a newspaper investigator looks at it, and even then, there are no consequences. So um, just collecting the data is not enough. W w is there any uh, anything else you would suggest? Well, I think, I mean, there are a number of things. First of all, there's certainly, if you find, looking at the data, that there are stark racial disparities uh, and likely unwarranted racial disparities, then clearly there has to be a conversation with the police department that can involve much better training, implicit bias training, which uh, uh, is, uh, I think, important. But also what I'd like to see, and it's hard to, this you know, may sound more touchy-feely, it's hard to, to uh, evaluate uh, um, in, in a quantitative way, but you know, to have police departments sit with the community and the data that they've collected. We, you know, the kind of data that we put out has nice, colorful charts that shows these vast racial disparities for low-level nonviolent offenses, and sit with community members, and I don't just mean community members, uh, you know, older community, younger community members, um, people from uh, 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 all, all parts of the community, people who are part, gang members, the whole community sit and look at the disparities and talk about why are we arresting people for this, why are we stopping people for this, and, and is it working, 
uh, and how does it feel for the community? How does it feel for officers? I mean, really have a more integrated and collaborative approach. And I know it sounds uh, all very nice, but I re in Cincinnati, this is something that to some extent was done through a collaborative agreement that was prompted by a lawsuit in federal court, et cetera, but where they, there was a collaborative agreement that involved the police, it involved business uh, community members, healthcare professionals, um, but also the community civil rights group to figure out why are relations with the police and the black community so bad? Why are the police shooting so many unarmed African-American men? We have to solve this as a the police are part of our community and so are the community and I think that that kind of uh, uh, re-envisioning a, a shared community goal and, and approaching it from that angle using data uh, and, and discussing it, um, uh, it takes a long time, but I think that's something that we really need to do as, as, as local communities. Uh, one Did question. Did you do any of this work west of the Mississippi or only? Your mic, your mic. I'm you kept saying Chicago, I mean, which is great, they're part of America too, but I was wondering <laughs> if we've done anything west of the Mississippi as well. Well, I, I would defer to Mr. Uh, is it Channon? Channon. Chan Channon about, about Northern California, but, but the Seattle Police Department, which I mentioned with the LEAD program, has uh, also been involved in, in lawsuits to do with excessive force and racial profiling. Uh -huh. Um, uh, same with the Portland Police Department. The LA Police Department, of course, has been under consent decree um, for many of the same problems. And so you, cer and you certainly see racial profiling uh, run amok in places like uh, Phoenix uh, with the Latino community. And so um, many police departments, I think, are, are certainly have these problems and, and, and others have been uh, looking at ways to solve them. And if you go down to Florida, we've seen uh, a similar uh, kind of outrageous disparities in places like Miami Garden. So th this is a national problem. It's just that the data that we focused on right now is more in the northern cities. In, we've, we focus more on the hit rate. We make them, they have to fill out every single stop and every person in the car for every stop. And we focus on the hit rate and make them justify why they stop these people. And we say the hit rate has to be the same for all races. And when you say we, who, who is the we? Uh, uh, Mr. Burris and I in our meetings with the police okay. department and uh, and the Judge Henderson and and uh, by by focusing on the hit rate and making them justify it we have brought down the number of people stopped without ever dealing with you know calling them racist or things mm -hmm. like that which are sort of conversation stoppers we yeah. focus on the law enforcement aspect what, why are you stopping this person and what have you found from stopping them? If you can't justify that consistently the same for whites and Asians as you do for blacks and Hispanics, then you have to change. I, just quickly, I would also say that if I would just uh, you know, want an honest conversation because when I, w I was a public defender in the South Bronx and I arraigned countless people for marijuana possession and then I go back to the Upper West Side where I grew up and I have friends who would buy it, have it delivered to their home and there is two, two very different worlds. But so, so why are we, why do we think it's okay to jail uh, back in 2006, seven and eight, uh, a, a black man who's 19 or a, a black woman who's 30 and, and crisscrossing the train because switching train cars because she's uncomfortable with uh, a guy who's on the car. Why are we arresting and throwing those people in jail if we're not willing to do it with, to, 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 to white folk who are doing the same thing? And if the answer is from the police, it's a crime fighting tool, right? We, we don't care about marijuana. This is how we bring down crime. Then let's talk about it, right? Let's at least acknowledge that, yeah, we do treat African Americans differently in the South Bronx for the same thing because we think it's an effective crime fighting tool. I don't agree with, but then let's have a discussion about that, um, uh, and and, I, and 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 with the community certainly about how they feel about that, um, instead of uh, somehow uh, uh, pretending that it's okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Narasaki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a few questions. So my first question is, um, are there studies that exist that look at the efficacy of independent review boards as it relates to use of force? So are there studies that, for example, would show that if you have an independent review board that has all of the power uh, it needs to function effectively, do, does use of force, does racial profiling, do, do complaints go down? Uh, or not, 
the second question is, according to the DOJ Office of Community Oriented Policing Services, they said one of the challenges has been that there's no accepted official definition of racial profiling, much less an operational definition that describes exactly what collected data and results would clearly identify racial profiling. So the, the, there's a challenge in terms of, of what this data means. Uh, and I'm wondering what, what the different viewpoints are. Is, what's the stark difference of opinion about what racial profiling should mean from a police perspective? I'm assuming the difference is from a police perspective and from a civilian perspective, but maybe it's somewhere else. What is that difference? Uh, and how do you get everyone to actually collect data? Because I know I worked on hate crime data collection for a long time, and a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies didn't want to do it because if they collected it and did it well, it would show a high number of hate crimes. So you would have, you know, Massachusetts with 40 hate crimes and Alabama with zero because Alabama wasn't collecting it. But you knew that probably that was not an accurate reflection of what was actually going on in the state. So, you know, is it tying uh, data collection to receipts of whatever the federal programs uh, funding uh, streams are? And then my last question is uh, to Mr. Channon. You made a number of references to unions, right? That unions, uh, and, and there is kind of a sense that, that police unions maybe have been in, in many cases part of the problem and not necessarily part of the solution. So I'm wondering what is the, what is the challenge with unions and uh, have there been effective ways uh, to really get them involved in a constructive way uh, one of the readings we had said that the Department of Justice reviews were a very important tool for police chiefs because that enabled them to be able to leverage the Department of Justice as basically bad cop uh, in order to get some of the, the changes through. Well, well the unions, uh, what I've tried to do in, more recently is uh, figure out anything that, that we have in common with unions, and there are some things. One is the uh, early warning systems, um, which are the, um, the systems. We have a computerized system in Oakland, which we're building a new one now, um, which uh, basically identifies outliers based on certain things that go into this early warning system, such as uh, uh, resisting arrests, automobile accidents, all sorts of different things. There's a long list of them. And then it looks at outliers. And then the outliers are, are, they talk, their cops have to talk about them. And some of them are okay, their reasons, they're in the SWAT team or something like that. Some of them are not. And then they work with those officers before they get in trouble with themselves, let's say through alcoholism or some problem they're having domestically, or with the community before they do something horrible to somebody and it's non-disciplinary and we've gotten the union on board for that. I've also worked with them um, on the radio systems which are defective in Oakland and gotten them and, and spoken for them. So those are things that I've tried to do but very often it's, it's, it's kind of hopeless with the wrong leadership and the wrong unions. So, so you've said that you've never seen one support a civilian review board. No. And why, why would there be opposition to an independent review board? Um, because uh, they're afraid of outside. It's a thin blue line. It's, it's, they, they just won't uh, see a civilian. I mean, uh, I mean in, in, in the United States, Barack Obama's never been in the military, <coughs> but he can fire the Joint Chiefs. But somehow that analogy hasn't quite made it to the police setting. and. Uh, um, and, and, and they just won't support them at all. I'd like to jump in on the, um, the data collection discussion because the National Science Foundation has appropriated um, $1 million to the Center for Policing Equity, which is out of UCLA, uh, to collect data from police departments on uh, pedestrian stops, vehicle stops, and the use of force. Currently, the idea is that departments volunteer to provide that information, one of the suggestions I put in my statement is that, as you mentioned, for any department seeking federal funds, they should volunteer 
to report their information to the um, national database is what it's called. Um, on the issue of defining racial profiling, um, the mathematicians have gotten, um, I think, have, have overly, have made this issue overly uh, problematic. Um, constitutional rights are private and individual. Social scientists tend to aggregate data. And so the notion that if I have the experience that the chairman had um, and I perceive that it's involves some racial profiling, um, the mathematicians say that they really can't measure that. And so we've gotten caught up in who, who, is, at, who is at risk for being stopped, um, the innocent behavior of innocent people of color is compared to the behavior of folks who happen to be of color and also be involved in criminality, and then that somehow is determined to be part of the equation of whether or not a stop that might be based on race, that the person who stopped believes it's based on race, whether the perception of the person stopped or the perception of the police officer or what the police officer says is what is actually racial profiling. Um, there are ways in which clearly disparate racially and economically, uh, ethnically disparate stops get explained away by really complex uh, mathematical equations. And I think therein lies our problem in trying to define what actually constitutes racial profiling. However, in cases like in New Jersey, where we have police officers do what the chairman talked about, they pled guilty to falsifying the records about the racial identity of people being stopped so that they could cover up the fact that they were engaged in racial profiling. Didn't get a lot of media att attention, but it is certainly the case that we've had those examples take place in other police departments. And so the, the notion is if they weren't racially profiling while they falsifi falsifying the information, right? I would just add also if you read uh, you know, Judge Shinlin's decision in the Floyd case, uh, you know, while it can get overcomplicated, we also can use data to uh, you do sophisticated analyses to show that, in fact, what is driving police behavior, even when you take into account other factors like crime rates, demographics, neighborhood, is race. Uh, and so that less goes to your uh, what's the dictionary definition, but we can use data uh, to show, and, and this was done also to some extent in Seattle, that people who are similarly situated are being treated differently because of the color of their skin when you control for other, other factors. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still not clear, like what is the difference, or I could, you know, cops will be, the cops office will be testifying, so maybe they can tell me as well, but I was just wondering, you had a perception about what the difference, why, why, why there isn't one universal definition. Well, I, I, I think there are indicia of racial profiling that are very clear. It's not complicated. If you're searching um, twice as many of one race and finding in percentage-wise uh, the same amount of contraband or reason for the stop as you are with white people, that means that you're racially profiling because if you should find twice as much yeah, but does everybody agree to that? That's like universally. No, no I, she's I, like I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know about everybody, but uh, the, the, we, we agree with it, and okay. the, the, we just can't. And it's and it's resulted in pounding away at this, at lowering the number that have been stopped in the first place, because now they know they have to justify it uh, with something that they find or or see or do. So I just have one more question. Uh, someone suggested to me that. One possible intervention would be to tie uh, salary raises of the entire department to overall reduction in complaints of use, you know, uh, of illegitimate use of force or uh, complaints in general in terms of, of how police are treating community members. Have you seen that in practice? How does that strike you? Bad idea, good idea? I've never seen it. I, it, I, I was told it was explored in discussion in San Francisco, which is why I was raising it. I think one of the reasons why it becomes problematic in my written statement, I talk about the fact that there are some individual officers who could be driving the majority number of complaints, and as has been said on other panels, the fact that there are officers who consistently operate within the law and restrain themselves, 
the that suggestion could overshadow yeah. or serve as a disincentive yeah. for those officers? Well, I think the thinking is that it might serve as an incentive for the good cops to uh, maybe have less of a blue line and drive out the bad cops because it's, you know, so it's an overall team effort uh, and it creates incentive for people to do what's in their individual best interest in terms of taking a harder stand against because my, my, the sense I get, whether it's Border Patrol or Immigration Service, you know, uh, or in this context, people pretty much know who the bad people are. They've seen it, they know it, they talk about it. And so the question is, how do you get them to do something about it? I think it can be a double-edged sword, because the one thing I didn't talk about in terms of what I do here is to teach sworn police officers um, in graduate classes and when you watch the dynamic I think that there are definitely will be officers who will never be comfortable with intervening um, there are certainly safety considerations uh, for officers um, who intervene and I think the proposition could cause more harm than good can you elaborate on safety like police so, are afraid of each other right Police are afraid, quite frankly, yes. The fact that they uh, all have guns and um, they depend on each other to have their back. And so the notion that a officer could, and, and there are techniques, so you get keyed out, you're going on a call and you need backup and you, the other officers don't come to back you up and then they prevent you from getting back up by keeping your, your, your radio tied up. And so those, those safety concerns are really um, cogent with uh, police officers. I want to go to also a point that the um, commission, the chairman made about um, having to follow the police to get um, the license plates in, in your incident. Mm -hmm. There is legislation pending here before city council in uh, New York called the Right to Know Act. Mm -hmm. And it would require that police officers, as a matter of routine, identify themselves during any encounters that they initiate with the civilians. And so it takes away the tension of having to ask for a badge number and a name. Um, it would also require that the police advise people that they have a right not to consent to a search. Mm -hmm. and, as a, and that would be a matter of routine. And so it would have helped you in uh, your situation. Yeah. I mean, if I hadn't had a friend in a local newspaper who did the search for me, I would not have yeah. known. I mean, you're uh, right to be afraid. I was in the back of a cab in California near Disneyland, and the cab got pulled over for speeding on the freeway, even mm -hmm. though he was going the rate of speed. Mm -hmm. And I, I was annoyed by this fact. Uh, and I asked for the cop's badge number, and he went at me. He refused mm -hmm. to give me his name and number mm -hmm. and tried to intimidate me. Uh, and threatened me with arrest for, and I was just the the passenger, passenger. in the back of the cab. So that's a penal <laughs> that's a penal code violation in California. Mm. Yeah, so I think they count on you since you don't have their name or badge number, <laughs> not being able to do anything about it. So uh, we're going to go to Commissioners Yaki, Cladney, and then the last questions will go to uh, the Vice Chair. But still wanted to make a point, Mr. Channon, that you know, your example of uh, in response to the question from. Uh, Commissioner Narasaki about uh, the police not wanting to go to outsiders uh, and, and sort of comparing that to the commander-in-chief having the right to fire the military. Uh, I, I think that distinction is, is not necessarily apples to apples because when we had a hearing a, about a year and a half ago, two years ago on sexual assault in the military, uh, the uh, generals that were st sitting in front of us like you were, were resistant to the idea of having civilian oversight. Yes, commander in chief is the commander in chief, but that's in the Constitution. I think when you get to issues of policing themselves, it becomes uh, a little more challenging. I agree with you. Yeah, uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first is uh, more of a statement, but if Mr. Shannon has a comment on it, I'd appreciate it. You work with Michael Haddad in in Oakland a, a lot, I presume, and yes. um, I, I bring this up because I was a little I was a little um, disturbed by a comment that a previous panelist had made, Mr. Smoot, about an expert named Bill Lewinsky, uh, who, who testifies about use of force by cops, all, by police all the time. And he made it seem like he is the expert on the subject of how reliable testimony is 48 hours after the fact. I just wanted to point out that Mr. Haddad, who your friend is, has disqualified Mr. Lewinsky from 
testifying before and has made has has raised the issue that uh, Mr. Lewinsky is someone who testifies routinely on behalf of police officers in excessive force shooting. So I'm not too sure how independent an expert he may be. But I just wanted I just wanted to raise that issue. This is from Mr. Blanks. Um, you raised about the data issue and about the the disproportionate number of complaints re related to rogue rogue cops. And I think that part of our problem is. I wonder if part of our problem is the fact that we tend to glorify some of these individuals and whether it's our own San Francisco Dirty Harry movies or Vic McKay on the Shield and others that we can talk about where, where the ends justify the means for some of these individuals. But what do you think about a proposal where the federal government would essentially start tying federal funding to police departments enacting uh, strict review and disciplinary procedures for officers who exceed X number of complaints a year. I mean, would that be effective? Would that work at all? Um, I'm not against tying federal funds to uh, to compliance with you know federal prerogatives. However, I, I getting back to a point earlier uh, with the data collection on like how many how many complaints they have. It, you're, what you have is a, an incentive for the police to then start cooking numbers about what. Uh, you know what they're going to report like you had the case here in New York I don't mean to be picking on New York they're just really good <laughs> at, uh, at documenting it here uh, Adrian Schoolcraft was an officer in uh, Bed-Stuy and he had uh, tape recordings of mm -hmm. uh, what the police uh, within, within his own unit were doing uh, to drop down the severity of crime because they wanted to keep the crime numbers down so they started kicking it down to like misdemeanors instead of you know like really a grotesque uh, assault and battery. He recorded it and then the retaliation against him was severe. They actually had him uh, involuntarily committed uh, and he had another recording of that incident when they said like, oh he was suicidal and, all, and it was absolutely not true and his, his lawsuit is still pending if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And so anytime you have these sort of like hardline stats and benchmarks that you're asking the police to fulfill, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of the in, unintended consequences of the lengths that they will go to and the lengths that, that they will use to enforce the blue wall to stop that. Uh, when, when they were talking about the, uh, the civilian complaints, I mean, even before, uh, there's a Human Rights Watch p paper from about 10 or 15 years ago that discussed the various levels of um, difficulties of filing a complaint. If you're going to an independent board, that's fine, but not every jurisdiction has that. And so you're, if you have an intake officer that's going to take the complaint, they are going to severely, uh, they very often they are going to severely dissuade the person from filing a complaint. And if that person has a record or if that person has uh, maybe friends or relatives that are, don't have documentation to be in this country legally, they're going to use intimidation against those people. So I'm not against it in theory, but in practice, I'm afraid of the unintended consequences. I guess I'm just, I'm just concerned that there's really no real answer to this question at all because even in my own experience with civilian review boards, if depending on who appoints the civilian review, review boards, that can be a politicized issue as well, especially with, with union support in different elections. So it, this is a conundrum that we're going to have to face and you know, the more that we get some information from you folks to help us think about it, the better. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Cladney, thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Cladney, then we'll close with uh, the Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, this question is going to be directed to Judge Mark and uh, Professor Jones-Brown because I, I, I think it focuses more on New York than anywhere else. But the chair spoke about uh, possible opportunities for, uh, he talked about that example when he was stopped as, as a young man, uh, possible police misconduct. And uh, I've always felt there's a real question as to whether the Fourth Amendment exists anymore when it comes to uh, vehicle searches. Uh, if a policeman is going to write you a ticket and you don't allow him to search your vehicle, he says he's going to arrest you and impound it, he can search it on the impound. Uh, and uh, today, the FBI lab situation came up where uh, they, I can't remember it exactly in the news, it was 250 plus people were convicted on evidence out of the lab that was testified to by FBI officers that were was inappropriately done or wrongfully done. I, I really can't remember. I heard it in the news this morning, 6 o'clock. And uh, here in New York, you've had uh, quite a few cases, uh, especially in Brooklyn, uh, 
of people being convicted on wrongful evidence. Uh, I guess my question is, is um, uh, are officers being charged when this is found, uh, or is there a crime actually committed by them that, that they are being uh, prosecuted for, or is it just that these uh, folks are let out of jail? Well, I, um, or prison, I should say. Yeah, I don't think there's one answer to that question. I mean, I, I can say, though, that when police officers violate <laughs> citizens' rights, um, um, there hasn't been a real effective solution to that problem. And I can tell you the exclusionary rule where, um, where the court finds that there's been a violation of the defendant's rights and evidence has to be excluded. Uh, sometimes that's the end of the case for the prosecution, sometimes it's not, but um, it's never been a particularly effective uh, remedy for uh, um, um, addressing people's uh, 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 violation of their constitutional rights, which isn't to say that, therefore, the evidence should be admitted. I'm not suggesting that at all, but that um, the, sort of the, the um, U.S. Supreme Court sanctioned remedy for violations of uh, constitutional rights, people's legal legal rights, has never been a f an effective solution. I mean, I think that as a society, we have to um, we have to look at ways that um, um, where the police violate people's rights, that um, there's an effective remedy for that. I mean, Any I mean, ideas? Uh, I think ultimately, um, um, you know, lawsuits against police officers, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, people who, who uh, more often than not, um, when people's rights are violated, they're, they're poor people, um, powerless people, and um, um, bringing a lawsuit, not an easy thing um, for someone in that situation. But I, I think ultimately police departments have to um, take action against their um, their officers when they violate people's rights, and um, you know that may be um, wishful thinking, but um, but may, maybe there are some creative ways to uh, to provide incentives for them to do that. With um, you know, there have been a number of suggestions here this afternoon about that federal money, um, uh, salary increases. Um, those are very interesting ideas that I think should be seriously considered. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, uh, Madam, I'm oh, sorry. I think, the onus is on, I think the onus is on prosecutors. I think um, what's going on in Brooklyn with DA Thompson will sort of maybe be a precedent for what happens when um, there is a large scale a determination that the police or, or prosecutors have um, engaged in misconduct in the uh, conduction of, of trials. The New Jersey case that is mentioned in my statement um, what happened to the police officers were simply they were charged with making false statements. And I think that that will, that minor level of prosecution um, may serve as, a, as an incentive or disincentive for officers to engage in that behavior. But I think ultimately it is on prosecutors to be willing to um, go after police officers when it is clear that they have engaged in misconduct that amounts to illegal behavior. Thank you. Just, Thank you. I'm just sorry, very, very quickly, Go I ahead. just wanted, I worked at the Innocence Project uh, at one point, and, and, and I just wanted to respond that in hundreds of cases where people have been uh, exonerated through DNA testing, there's almost never the kind of, I guess, you know, the kind of uh, strong accountability for officers or uh, prosecutors. In fact, it's hard enough for people who have spent decades in jail to even get compensated just get compensated, let alone accountability. I do think, and again, this is somewhat off script, but when we talk about accountability, while of course we want to have, there's a certain vengeance involved there, I, each time you have a wrongful conviction or somebody's rights are, are severely violated, it's a learning opportunity and a teaching opportunity for police, for prosecutors, for the community. Every time a plane crashes, you know, we have send investigators in and try to figure out everything that went wrong so that we make sure that it never happens again. And we don't do that in the same way with wrongful convictions and violations of rights. And while I think certainly we want to figure out how can you, you know, bring uh, uh, sometimes harsh remedies to bear, which is very hard to do with qualified immunity and absolute immunity. And uh, I, I think there's also, again, a larger community-based discussion that should happen with prosecutors, the wrongly convicted, the defense lawyers, about how this went wrong.
so we can try to get it right and have a more kind of holistic idea of, of, of um, uh, accountability as opposed to just how do we then throw another person in jail, et cetera. Thank you. Madam Vice Chair, you can conclude the panel. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I'll try to do that uh, promptly. I've indicated before that I'm a former uh, state trial and appellate judge, and as we've been uh, looking at the issue of police practices and the excessive use of force, I've given, and as we've given thought to possible uh, solutions and uh, recommendations, I've, I've found myself faced with uh, the thought that, well, what about judges uh, in all of this? Our justice system, in fact, does make it uh, extremely difficult to hold police accountable, um, and that judges and the courts do have a role in, in all of this. You know, for example, I think one of our other panelists um, spoke to us about the doctrine of qualified immunity. I'd like uh, Judge Marks, um, please, to comment, if he would, about um, judges and uh, the role we play or don't play in all of this. Um, do we have a role to play in police accountability um, and helping police get to where we would want them to be uh, in terms of safeguarding and uh, protecting all of us? Well, I, I think judges absolutely have a role. You know, really the courts are the ultimate guardians of people's rights, constitutional <laughs> and otherwise. Um, but I think this is a problem that, um, uh, I mean, too many problems end up in the courts in our society, um, problems that uh, legislators uh, and, and uh, executives can't seem to resolve, can't agree on, and then the, the problems get dumped in the courts. I mean, your experience over the last 12 years is probably a good example of that. Um, so I, I, I think courts absolutely play a role. I mean, if, if evidence is, if, if is unconstitutionally seized and someone is uh, charged with a crime, courts have to be vigilant and uh, um, uh, um, seeing through that and excluding evidence. Um, but of course, that's the tip of the iceberg, as we know in New York City. Uh, uh, only 10% of the searches resulted in uh, um, evidence being being obtained and, and charges being brought, if, if it was even that, that much, less. even less than 10%. Um, in the end, I, I mean, I, I don't see the courts as the, the courts play a role here, but I don't see the ultimate solution in the courts. Uh, I think that the ultimate solution is with, with police departments themselves. And um, police departments have to police themselves. And um, But when they don't, what role do the judges have in making um, sure that it happens well, like, th throughout uh, qualified okay. immunity and um, you know, there are other doctrines that we're all familiar with. Yeah. The, again, judges play an important role in this, and the, the, the federal decision in New York, uh, the, the lawsuit uh, that was brought, uh, Judge Shinlin's decision, um, has had an extraordinary impact. I mean, I think stop and frisks, which um, were, were clearly being overused in New York for many years, even before her decision started to decline, and since the decision of declined tremendously and you know very interesting because one would think e even if you felt that um, the police department was overusing um, that technique and um, um, and you would think though that the overuse of that technique would lead to less crime that uh, even if less than 10 percent of the people that you're stopping and frisking are carrying a gun or you know some other uh, contraband um, you would think that that would reduce crime. It would be effective in reducing crime. The remarkable thing is, thanks to a judge's decision, or at least in large part to a judge's decision, um, the number of illegal stops and frisks has plummeted in this city, and crime has continued to go down. I mean, it's really remarkable if you think if, about if it. If I could just jump in for one minute or less. Jump in. Um, I, I think judges have a very important role. Uh, the use of injunctive relief, such as uh, uh, the judge just said by in the stop and frisk and in Maricopa County in Arizona, 
uh, the judge there has almost single-handedly stopped uh, Sheriff Opio uh, from some of his more egregious um, um, uh, mistakes, shall we say. And Judge Henderson in our court uh, has done a fantastic job in, in hanging in there for all these years. Um, I think judges are critical because they're the only ones, especially federal judges, when the legislature and the city councils are all going or being scared off by crime, they're the ones who can come in and really make the changes that need to be made. I agree uh, with you, but... Uh, <laughs> could I, I just please, comment on that? Professor. Um, the, the, so the bulk of my, my statement has to do with the, the shift in the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court's um, reasoning about these issues. And I think that the uh, Connor decision, the Graham versus Connor decision, was a mistake. And I think that it has um, contributed to the um, rise in incidents or the number of incidents or the frequency of incidents that we see. I think the other challenge is when officers choose to have a bench trial, um, that judges have to be willing to say that the officers have done something wrong um, that is illegal. And I'm most disturbed by uh, Judge Shinlin, that's Gerald Shinlin. Um, his decision to say that Anthony Baez's death was unnecessary and avoidable, and then to acquit the officer of wrongdoing. I think uh, that kind of, um, the announcement itself confuses the public, because how can you say that it's unnecessary and avoidable, but then not hold the officer criminally liable? And I think that um, local judges are under pressure, just as prosecutors are under pressure, to stand by the police and I think they have to be brave. And when wrong is wrong, they have to be willing to find criminal liability or else the, the system will never have the kind of legitimacy, particularly for people of color um, who need most to trust in the system. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate this panel. Uh, the information is extremely helpful to our end goal here. So um, we hope you'll be able to stay in and watch the next panels as you uh, step down, we're going to ask the folks from panel four to begin to make their way towards the podium, and our staff will change the name cards. Um, commissioners, I see some of you are stepping away, but we're going to continue to move forward. Um, I'm going to take a break between this panel and the end of this panel and the beginning of the next, but we'll continue now.